Where's Joel shouted at his short, curly-haired dolt of a friend. What were you thinking, dude? I need food. It's not all about you, Joel, Wes said. Stick it in your ear. Joel set his case on a bale of hay and took out his guitar. He crossed to one of the amps set up at the back of the barn, plugged the guitar in and left it leaning against a couple of spare tyres stacked along the wall. He didn't play guitar in the group that often. Mostly, he was the drummer. Sometimes, though, he and Evan swapped out. Evan was a passable drummer, and he could keep the beat when Joel really wanted to be on the guitar. Joel watched Wes uh, concentrate on a riff he was working on, his dark brown hair flopping over his pale face. Sick, Joel said when Wes stopped playing. Zach sat down at the keyboard. We starting? Joel took a seat behind the drum set. He and Wes followed Zach's lead into the song they'd been practicing the night before. The barn had surprisingly good acoustics, and Joel was lost in the music within seconds of beating the skins. Evan arrived around the time the pizza arrived, and after they all stuffed themselves on pepperoni and pepperoncini, what is pepperoncini? And pepperoncini pizza, they started to playing, or they returned to playing, what, started to playing? I'm losing my words. They jammed until Joel watched at his watch just after... I'm completely messing up. They jammed until Joel glanced at his watch, not watched at his watch, just after midnight. I gotta quit early tonight, he said. My freaking dad is forcing me to get up before dawn to work. Wes set down his guitar and stretched. Hey, be, ga be glad you have that job. I'd kill to work for someone like your dad. Joel grimaced. You don't know what you're talking about. My dad's a slave driver. You've never flipped burgers at BJ's. Now that guy is a slave driver. Wes groaned. Minimum wage for uh, for working over a dirty hot grill, getting yelled at all the time because you're not doing it fast enough. At least you don't have to shovel manure, Joel said. Zach laughed. I think you're shoveling some yourself, Joel. He got up from the keyboard and shook his head. You've got a great life, dude, and instead of appreciating it, you're always grousing at it. You're in such a hurry to leave behind. <clears throat> Joel frowned at his friend. You want to get into the music scene too. You said you couldn't wait for us to go out on our own. Yeah, but that's a figure of speech. I'm looking forward to it, but I can also appreciate what I have now. I just think sometimes your anger blinds you to what's good is all. What the hell do you know about it? Joel snapped. Zack held up his hands in surrender. Dude, I'm, I'm just saying, if you slow down in life, you can enjoy the scenery on the way to where you want to be. Joel snorted. What are you? Some kind of guru? When Zack just smiled and shrugged, Joel slammed his guitar into his case and stomped out of the barn. Joel was grinding his teeth when he got into his truck under a star-filled sky and quarter moon. Where did Zack get off telling Joel what to do? Joel got enough of that from his parents. See you guys tomorrow night, Evan called as he and Wes headed toward their own vehicles. Joel grudgingly waved at his friends, pulled out and headed toward the gates of Zach's family farm. Or Zach's family's farm. He could see Evan's headlights behind him. Evan drove an old red sports car that had bug-eyed headlights set close together. Tall and lanky, Evan barely fit in the thing but he loved it, inherited it from his grandpa. Too bad Joel didn't have a grandpa. His parents' parents were all dead, long dead. He hadn't inherited squad from any of them. How is that fair? Behind Evan's little car, Wes's jacked-up truck shot light over the top of Evan's car and in through Joel's rear window. The searing light reflected into his eyes from the rearview mirror, pissing him off. He should have a big truck like Wes's, instead of this old piece of garbage he was driving. He shoved his foot down on the accelerator in anger, and as he shot through the gates of the farm, he fishtailed onto the country road and punched it back toward town. Rattling just enough to piss him off even more, Joel's truck attempted to reach 80 miles per hour on the straight stretch of narrow road that ran along the edge of the farm on one side and an old forest on the other side. If Evan or Wes had been coming this way too, Joel was sure they could have caught it up to him in a nanosecond and blown him off the road. Thankfully though, they lived on the other side of town and they took a different route home. 
Lowering the passenger side window so he could feel air rushing through the cab, Joel let out a shout. Whether it was a shout of rage or a shout of glee, he couldn't have said. His emotions were a mess. He hated his truck, but he was loving the feel of its 435 horsepower engine rumbling under his control. The country road leading back to civilization came to a fork in the road near town. One branch of the Y led to more farms spreading out in the valley. The other led abruptly into one of the town's outlying subdivisions and expanse of 20-year-old ramblers that all looked alike and sat too close to each other. Uh, to, <laughs> I was going to say to each other, but then I, I realised it was together, so I said to each other. <laughs> Joel hated the subdivision, but even though the speed limit in the area was just 25 miles per hour, cutting through it got him home faster, and he needed to get back and catch some sleep if he was going to make it work before dawn. Joel slowed as he downshifted for the turn into the subdivision, but he didn't slow enough. Just as, had, just as he had earlier in the week, he slid around the corner out of control fighting to keep the truck on the road because he sure as heck didn't want to go into the deep ditch he knew ran along the shoulder here. Joel cursed himself for being so reckless. He knew better than to take the corner at this speed. At one point, he felt the tyres come off the road, and for a split second, he thought the truck was going to flip. His heart stopped beating for an instant, but then the truck settled, even though it was still in a skid. Joel let the truck have its way with the asphalt, and he even began enjoying the adrenaline rush of the slide. He enjoyed it, that is, until he saw the child caught in his headlights. A child? What in the hell was a kid doing out after midnight? As soon as he saw the kid, Joel jammed his foot on the brakes. He didn't even downshift, he just hit the brakes. The truck bucked, but it didn't slow fast enough. The front bumper slammed into the child with a thud that seemed to reverberate through the truck and right into Joel's body. As soon as he heard the impact, Joel wanted to squeeze his eyes shut and pretend he was someplace else, but he couldn't. It was like his gaze was tied by a string to the, traje to the trajectory of the child's body as it flew up and out, away from the truck and then disappeared off the road. He assumed they landed in the deep ditch just off the pavement. The truck lurched to a stop, and because Joel hadn't depressed the clutch, uh, the engine died. A few clicks sounded from under the hood, and Joel's panting breath filled the cab. Outside, crickets chir chirruped. In the distance, a dog barked. Joel forced himself to quit his br to quiet his breathing. He needed to listen. Was there any sound coming from the ditch? Was the kid? Joel closed his eyes tight, but that didn't do anything to make what just happened go away. As soon as his lids came down, his mind replayed the impact of his truck against the kid in slow motion. Joel was able to see details he'd missed when it had happened in real time. In this slow-mo replay, Joel was able to see that the kid's body was small. The kid couldn't have been more than six or seven maybe, and what was it, a boy or a girl? It was impossible to tell. The kid was wearing dark pants, maybe jeans, and a dark jacket. He, she... Joel decided to stuck with it, to stick with it. Thinking it didn't feel as bad as he or she. Again, what in the hell was a kid doing out at this hour? Joel sat behind the wheel and thought about the body his truck had just tossed into the ditch. He should get out and check on it, shouldn't he? Of course he should. But he couldn't. He, he just absolutely couldn't. The very thought of trying to get out of his truck made him start to shake. No, that wasn't true. He was already shaking. But the idea of getting out of the truck made him shake even more intensely. The entry to the subdivision was flanked with two big stone monument-like signs that announced the subdivision's name, Glenwood Fields. A decorative area filled with seasonal flowers, daffodils now, surrounded the signs. The first houses on the street were well beyond the decorative area. This meant no houses looked directly out at the corner. And even the nearest houses were dark. No one seemed to be up, except the crazy kid in the middle of the road. Joel realised he was gripping the steering wheel so tightly that his palms were starting to hurt. He let go of it and stretched his hands. What are you going to do, dude? He asked himself out loud. His stomach felt heavy. The pizza he'd eaten was gurgling around and threatening to climb back up into his throat. He pressed a hand to his stomach. 
What should he do? For some reason, he glanced in his rear view. In his, it's not supposed to say rear view again. It's 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 another typo. It says review. He glanced in his review mirror, and his decision was made for him. Headlights were coming down the country road, heading toward the corner. No way was he going to be caught sitting here. His legs. Uh, feeling weak and rubbery, Joel managed to position his feet on the clutch pedal and the brake pedal. With a trembling hand, Joel reached for the key and turned the ignition. To his surprise, it started immediately. Joel put his hands at 2 o'clock and 10 o'clock on the steering wheel and eased out the clutch as he gently accelerated. As soon as the truck was rolling, uh, rolling, he sped up and in spite of what just just happened, he raced home at double the posted speed limit the whole way. Joel should have fall, fallen asleep at the second he threw himself on the bed. He was beyond tired. Apparently, however, he was so far beyond tired that he'd circled back around to wide awake. His eyes just wouldn't close. It was like they were taped open or something. Most Friday and Saturday nights, because of the long days and late nights playing music, Joel went to sleep so fast that when he'd wake up the next morning on top of his covers in the exact same position as when he felt... Wait... That he'd wake... Yeah, sorry, yeah, I said that completely wrong. But you get the idea. Uh, the, sorry. This drove his mum crazy, usually triggering one of her why did we bother lines. Why did we bother getting you nice sheets and blankets when you're just going to sleep on top of them? Joel turned over for the th third time since he flopped in his bed. It didn't do any good. He was still wide awake. No matter how much Joel squirmed around in his bed or scrunched and re-scrunched his pillow to get his body in a comfortable position... His eyes remained open, staring at the shadows in his overstuffed room. But no, his eyes weren't staring at the shadows. That was the problem. His eyes apparently were still back at the entrance to Glenwood Fields, and they were stuck in a time loop there, watching the little kid get flung into the ditch over and over and over. PTSD, basically. Um, Joel groaned and wiped his eyes with the back of his knuckles, as if he could erase his inner film loop by scrubbing it away. It didn't work. Not only was the kid still flying through the air in Joel's mind, now Joel's eyeballs felt like they had rolled in gravel and been stuck back in his head. His eyes felt scratchy, and they stung. Joel sat up and turned on the wrought iron lamp on his nightstand. He rubbed his eyes again and he put his head in his hands. He breathed in and out a few times and squared his shoulders. He should go back. Why? Oh no, he really should. The kid could be alive, just hurt and unable to get out of the ditch. It wasn't terribly cold out tonight, but it was still chilly. The kid had been wearing that dark jacket, dumb kid, so it wasn't going to freeze to death or anything. But what if it was bleeding? Joel had to check on the kid. He stood. He tried to take a step toward the door of his room, but he couldn't. His sense of self-preservation wouldn't let him, even though his morals warned him to do the right thing. His survival instinct had a different opinion. It was laying out the facts. The second Joel went back to check on the kid, he was committing himself uh, to deep trouble. Even if he could pretend that he hadn't left the scene of the accident, the fact that he knew the kid was in the ditch would be an admission of guilt that he'd hit the kid. His skid marks would prove he was going too fast as he went around that corner. He'd be charged with reckless driving at minimum. Minimum? Minimum. And if the kid was dead... Joel started breathing fast, so he sat back down. He hugged himself and rocked back and forth. He knew he was acting like a little kid himself, but he didn't care. He was on the verge of a panic attack. If the kid was dead and Joel admitted that he was the one who hit the kid, Joel would go to jail. No going to LA to break into the music scene. No being free to live his life. If he thought, if he thought working for a living was its own kind of prison, there was no way he would last long in an actual prison. Joel started breathing fast, so he s sat back down. He hugged himself and rocked back and... Are you kidding me? Oh, this keeps happening. <laughs> uh, Joel quickly reached out and turned off his lamp. He got under the covers and pulled them up to his chin. With great determination, he was able to force his eyes closed. He was doing his best to imitate a normal person getting ready to sleep instead of a guilty person too spun up to, to sleep. Joel's eyes opened again. That was the problem. He was guilty of a crime, and he knew it. He'd hit a kid, and he'd fled the scene. He couldn't justify what he'd done the way he could justify leaving work a few minutes early or getting bad grades or not taking as many showers as his mum wanted him to take. There was no 
hey, that's just who I am defense for what he'd done. It was wrong. No one would argue differently. Right now, the kid Joel hit could be dying because no one, except Joel, knew the kid was in the ditch. It was wrong. No, it was bordering on downright despicable to leave the kid there. But face it, that's what Joel was going to do. He had to accept it. He wasn't about to get out of bed and go check on the kid and risk getting arrested for what he'd done. He just wasn't. Besides, if the kid was alive, maybe he could get out on his own. Maybe someone else would find him. And if he was dead, what did it matter? Oh my god. Joel, you are a douchebag. <laughs> Sorry, let me just have a quick drink of water because my, I can tell my voice is going again. I'm not having a great November so far. <laughs> Went straight into November feeling ill. Lovely. Um, okay, let's continue. <clears throat> when the overhead light in Joel's room went on, it almost literally reached into Joel's bed, scooped him up, and tossed him across the room. The brightness was so shocking that Joel cap catapulted from his bed and didn't realise what was going on until he was stumbling through a pile of discarded smelly t-shirts. Rise and shine, his mum said. What the? Joel shook his head and blinked, squinting against the brain-searing light that assaulted his eyes. Past sleep crusted eyelids, he could see his mother standing in the doorway of his room. Her hair was in the top knot she put it in for sleep, and she was wrapped in her red terry cloth robe. Your dad's in the shower, his mum said. He'll be ready to go in 15 minutes. I didn't hear your alarm go off, so I figured I should wake you. You better get ready. Joel moaned and began shuffling toward his bathroom. He had to pee, and he needed to do something about the cotton that must have been stuffed into his head while he slept. Joel, his mother said. He turned and frowned at her. What? I'm up. I can see that, but move a little faster, will you? Joel grimaced and returned to shuffling. He was almost to the bathroom. What did she want him to do? Leap to the toilet in a single bound? Joel? He whirled and glanced at her. What? She sighed. Take a shower. You stink. Joel turned away from her without answering. He went into his bathroom and shut the door. Hoping his mother would be gone when he came out of the bathroom, Joel peed, splashed water on his face, and pushed on the jeans and pulled on the jeans, sorry, and t-shirt he'd, he'd left lying on the floor the night before. What was the point in showering and putting on clean clothes when he was going to be sweaty within the first half hour of working at the nursery? Joel faced himself in the mirror. Man, he looked like crap. His usually thick, wavy hair was limp. He looked pale. His eyes were bloodshot. What was wrong with... Oh, yeah. That. Apparently, sometime during the night, Joel managed to find... Uh, to find? What? Joel had managed the miracle of finding sleep. And when he went to sleep, he'd also had another miracle. He'd forgotten what he'd done. But now he'd remembered. Joel dropped the toilet seat lid down uh, and sat down. He took several deep breaths. His mind started to review what he'd done, but he stopped it. No! He snapped. He wasn't doing the replay thing again today. It was bad enough he had to get up before 5am to work. He wasn't going to add a guilt trip on top of it. It might not be too late, his consciousness whispered to him. Um, you could go help the kid. He stood up and charged out of the bathroom. He still wore the socks he had on the night before and he didn't bother changing them. Instead, he stuffed his feet into the dirty shoes he'd kicked off before he dropped into his bed. He unearthed one of his D'Agostino Garden Centre baseball caps from, a, up from under a pile of dirty socks and jammed it on his head. He grabbed his wallet and his keys from the pile of sheet music on his desk and he left his room. He ran into his dad in the hallway. Good, you're ready, his dad had said. Joel grunted, then said, let's do this. He followed his dad down the hall, his shoes sinking into the plush grey carpet and his nostrils twitching in reaction to his dad's powerful musky cologne. He kept his gaze focused on his dad's precisely trimmed greying black hair and the farmer's tanned skin on the back of his neck. Joel kept his brain turned off. His dad trotted down the stairs and headed into the kitchen. Joel followed. His mum stood at the counter still in her robe. She appeared to be watching her coffee brew. 
The kitchen was filled with the smell of it. Joel's dad stopped to kiss his wife. Joel ignored his parents and went through the utility room and out into the garage. He was getting into his truck when his dad stepped into the garage and pressed the garage door opener. Oh, yeah, garage door opener. Why don't we head in together this morning? Joel's dad asked. We can stop and get donuts on the way. Joel inwardly cringed, but he was too distracted by what he'd done the night before to argue. He shrugged. Whatever. He closed his truck door and got into his dad's truck. His dad grinned and slid in behind the wheel. Three dozen donuts coming up, his dad said. One dozen plain glazed, one dozen chocolate covered, one dozen jelly filled. Joel glanced at his dad and ignored to urge to roll his eyes. It sounded like his dad was giving his order and they were still in the garage. Raspberry jelly, of course, his dad continued. What else? Joel said, just to say something. He couldn't have cared less about the donuts. His mind was still stuck in the loop of the kid getting into the ditch, over and over and over. Joel clenched his fists. Should he tell his dad what he did so they could go check on the kid? His dad started his practically new truck with a push of a button and backed down the driveway. He pulled away from the house and accelerated. Joel pressed his lips together and took a deep breath. He was clearly losing it. There was no way he was going to tell his dad he'd hit a kid. Why did he even think that? Joel forced himself to look out at the dark street in front of them. He shoved aside the image of the kid in the ditch. Joel usually cut through Glenwood Fields to get to Sally's. The cafe was just outside town, on the opposite end from the garden centre. Going through downtown was slower because of the stoplights. Joel hated stop stoplights. Thankfully though, his dad loved driving through downtown, so Joel didn't have to face Glenwood Fields. Consistency is the key to a good life, Joel, his dad said as he turned into Main Street. Same donuts, same customers, same good results. Joel raised an eyebrow at his dad. He so wanted to tell his dad how full of it he was, but instead he turned and looked out the window. As soon as he looked, he was sorry he did, because he glimpsed one of those plastic kids at play figures sitting at the edge of the sidewalk. Has that always been there? Joel frowned and turned to look back at it. The yellowish kid-shaped figure squatted next to a rose bush in front of the last house before the business section of the town began. Joel was pretty sure he'd never seen one of those plastic things next to that rose bush. The truck came to a stop and Joel looked ahead through the windshield. They were at the first of four stoplights in the tiny downtown area. The street was deserted because it was still dark out. None of the businesses were open. The streetlights and lit up window displays along the sidewalk cast yellow and pale white glows out onto the empty pavement. A flash of irritation lit up in Joe's mind. How dumb was it that they were sitting here, idling at a stoplight when there wasn't anyone else around? Joel shifted in his seat. It was making him nuts sitting here in the truck. He needed to get to the nursery so he could get to work. For once, he looked forward to it. It would take his mind off, Joel groaned. You do realise LA has nothing but traffic jams and stoplights, his dad said. Huh? Joel said. I can feel your impatience, son, his dad said. I know you hate stoplights. I was just reminding you that there will be a lot of them where you plan to go. Joel didn't want to talk about stoplights. That's different. A stoplight is a stoplight is a stoplight, his dad said. I've always kind of liked stoplights. Gives you a breather, a chance to look around, notice things. Joel's dad glanced toward the right side of the road. He grinned and pointed. See? Like that, right there. See that pink dress in the window of lovely ladies? The light turned green, and Joel's dad didn't press on the accelerator. Joel turned and looked in the, uh, in the direction his dad was pointing. He nodded when he saw a frilly pink dress. Lori Unger had a dress like that when we were in fifth grade. Boy, did I have a crush on her. Joel's dad finally went through the intersection. Joel once again turned to look out the window, but his vision was blurring the storefronts, the lights, and the sidewalk. Instead of seeing downtown, he was seeing the kid in the ditch. It took a couple more minutes to get through the other spot stop, eh, stoplights. During that time, Joel's dad started rambling about some new kind of fertilizer he wanted to stock. 
Joel couldn't do anything but grunt in response because just before the last stoplight, he'd spotted yet another one of the kids that play plastic fe figures. This one, he was sure he'd never seen before. It sat at the corner of Main and Fifth, next to the old phone booth at the gas station. There was no way one of those figures had been there a couple of days ago when Joel stopped to get gas. No way. Joel stared at the thing, and he could have sworn it was looking back at him accusingly. But that wasn't possible, right? After what felt like an eternity, Joel's dad finally pulled into Sally's new, nearly empty parking lot. It was a few minutes before five. He drove around to the back of the log cabin style building. Sally's didn't open until six, but she started making donuts and sweet rolls in the middle of the night. Joel's dad had a standing order with Sally for three dozen donuts every Saturday morning. Joel never saw the point of the donuts, but his dad swore it brought more people into the garden centre on Saturdays. Joel's dad stopped his truck near the cafe, cafe's back door. Can you run in and get the donuts? He asked Joel. Sure. Joel threw open the passenger door eagerly. He needed to be moving, not sitting still, thinking. It was still completely dark outside. The sun wasn't even debating getting up yet. It was full on asleep behind the mountains in the distance. The quarter moon was still lingering in the sky, shining its weak light down on the craggy outlines of the mountain's peaks. Joel had no trouble seeing, though. A glaring spotlight on a pole next to Sally's threw its illumination down over the back door. Even without the light, Joel could have found his way. The aromas of frying oil, sugar, cinnamon, and chocolate wafted out from the partially open doorway. Joel grasped the door's rough handle and pulled it open. Sally? he called. She didn't answer, but he stepped inside. The door opened into the huge kitchen that ran along the back side of the building. Sally was always in that kitchen this time of morning, but today, she wasn't here. Joel stopped and looked around. He cocked his head and listened. Past the sounds of sizzling oil and the hum of the walk-in refrigerator, he heard a woman talking. The words were muted, but it sounded like Sally. She had a deep, distinctive, gravelly voice. Joel hesitated, looking around to see if the donuts might just be ready for him to take. Sometimes they were, and he knew his dad paid monthly, so all Joel had to do was pick them up. However, no donut boxes sat on the counter. In fact, very little was on the counters. A mixing bowl was filled with some kind of batter. A couple pans of cinnamon rolls were sitting near the oven. But where were all the cooling racks filled with donuts? Joel took a step toward the voice he could still hear. He called Sally's name again. The voice stopped talking. A scrape preceded a tapping sound, and Sally stepped into the kitchen from a hallway at the far end of it. Oh, Joel, it's you. Sorry, I'm behind. Sally wiped her eyes and busted towards Joel. Bustled. <laughs> um, a plump woman. Sorry, a plump woman with hair dyed even blacker than Joel's was naturally Sally. Oh, sorry. I know I'm completely I'm completely screwing this up. A plump woman with hair dyed even blacker than Joel's was naturally Sally was probably in her 70s by now. Her face was lined, but it was always cheerful, except for today. Joel frowned at Sally's smudged mascara, her red ears. Uh, ears? Eyes? Oh my god. Her red ears? <laughs> her red eyes and her compressed lips. Um, are you okay? He asked. He didn't really care how she was, but he figured he should say something. She was obviously not acting normally. Oh, Joel, no, I'm not okay. Was it her child or something? <laughs> Um, Sally perched on a stool near her near the long marble counter where she rolled dough. Joel was used to seeing that counter filled with cut-out doughnuts ready for the fryer. Sally looked at the counter as if she was seeing what was usually there too. I'm so behind. When I got the news, I just stopped baking. I couldn't even think. I've been on the phone calling people who might have seen him, talking to Chief Montgomery, He's taking it seriously, thank God. Oh no, it's the kid. Joel had no idea what Sally was talking about. I I I'm sorry, he said. What news? As soon as he asked, he knew the answer. This was a small town. It was unlikely there was some upsetting news that had nothing to do with a child who'd gotten hit by a truck the night before. Or maybe that wasn't true. Maybe Sally's upset had nothing to do 
with what Joel had done. His mother, even his friends, were always telling him, it's not always about you, Joel. He was jumping to conclusions because he felt guilty. My grandson is missing, Sally said. My five-year-old grandson? Or maybe it was about Joel this time. How many little kids in a town this size went missing in a single night? Probably not more than one. Huh? Huh? Oh, oh, no, oh, okay, he's saying, what if it isn't me? Wait, it probably is, because more than one child wouldn't go missing in one night. Okay, okay, I thought that was a reference to the MCI, but never mind. Uh, Joel had no idea what he should do now. Should he ask questions? That would be the normal thing to do, right? He had to act normal, not guilty, normal. Since when? Joel blurted. Was that a good first question? Apparently it wasn't a bad one, because Sally immediately answered it. He wasn't in his bed when my daughter went to check on him, a little after midnight. She stays up late most nights. She's taking night classes and that's when she studies, after Caleb goes to sleep. She always looks in on him before she goes to bed, and he wasn't there. Sally reached into the pocket of her pink frilly apron and pulled out a handful of crumpled tissues. She blew her nose on one. Her nose was as red as her eyes. She didn't worry at first. She continued. Because Caleb is... She sniffed, waved a hand, and tried a smile that looked more like a grimace. A bit of a mischievous boy. He likes to pray, play pranks. He hates following rules. He's gone off his own at least half a dozen times. He calls his adventures walkabouts. She sniffed again. Joel was having trouble focusing on Sally's words. He had too much going on in his head to listen to her. First, there was his heartbeat, which was for some reason resounding off the inside of his skull. Second, there was the replay of the truck hitting the kid. It had a soundtrack in his mind. The squealing tires, the revving engine, the thud. Third, there was his inner dialogue. You should say something. Don't be an idiot. Say nothing. Just play dumb. What if he's still alive? Joel concentrated on turning down the volume of his brain's chatter so he could hear Sally. He didn't really want to hear her, but if he didn't act right when she talked, she could get suspicious. 